welcome Phyllis Lockett. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I was taught that the world has a lot of problems, but that I could struggle and change them. That intellectual and material gifts brought the privilege and responsibility of sharing with others less fortunate. And that service is the rent each of us pays for living. It's the very purpose of life, not something you do in your spare time or after you've reached your personal goals. These are the words and mantra that this year's Lifetime Achievement Award recipient has used to define her life and ultimately impact millions of children across our country. Marion Wright Edelman has been an advocate for disadvantaged Americans her entire life, a true champion of the civil rights movement. After being arrested for her activism, she attended Yale Law School to address racial bigotry and injustice head on. She became the first black woman admitted to the Mississippi Bar. There, she directed the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, where she worked on voter registration drives and supporting those who were in prison that were fighting for their right to vote. In 1968, she moved to Washington, D.C. and served as counsel for the Poor People's Campaign alongside Martin Luther King, Jr. As founder of the, and president of the Children's Defense Fund, she has worked tire, tirelessly speaking truth to power to persuade Congress to overhaul foster care, support adoption, improve child care, and to protect children who are disabled, homeless, abused, and neglected. In 2000, she received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian award. Marion Wright Edelman, an American hero, a national treasure, an icon on whom shoulders we all stand. Please join me in watching this video of this remarkable woman. The year is 1960. Marion Wright Edelman was a student at Spelman College, an outstanding student was during the height of the Civil Rights Movement. She was one of these leaders who spoke up and spoke out against segregation and racial discrimination. She worked with Martin Luther King Jr. like we all did. We were meeting somewhere every day, either at a lunch counter or in jail. And the first day of our jail experience, March 15th, 1960, Marion was a part of that experience. It was very dangerous. People had been beaten, arrested, jailed, but she went in places that others dared to go. In the late 1960s, we used to go to Washington for the famous peace marches. We were all in awe of Marion. I met Marion uh, in 1967. Uh, I was working for uh, Senator Robert Kennedy. We went to Mississippi because there was a big uh, fight going on about the future of the Head Start program. Marion Edelman had been an attorney at that time with the Legal Defense Fund and had taken Senator Kennedy and others on a tour to see hunger in real life and translated that into a national problem and received national attention. That really sparked the origin and the development of the Children's Defense Fund as a follow-up to the civil rights era and a focus on children specifically. She founded the Children's Defense Fund. It became her baby. Education is a critical part of our mission because we really see it as a continuation of children's civil rights. And if, in fact, children are going to thrive in school and thrive in the education realm, we've got to ensure that they're healthy. 
You can't learn if you haven't eaten breakfast or lunch. You can't learn if you live in an abusive uh, situation. You can't learn if you don't have good health care. So Marion thinks about the totality of all the social elements that have to be in place for young people to learn, but also to have all the opportunities that every other child has. Marion grew up in a small town in South Carolina, totally segregated. That is what drove her. Her parents were absolutely determined that all five of the children in the family would go to college, and of course that was the bridge out. Zelderman has taught us that education is a gateway for children. If you know better, if you learn better, if you have opportunity, then you have a fighting chance in this nation. The work that she does now with the Freedom Schools, which is a major effort in over 100 locations uh, in the United States, I think is her passion at the moment. I speak to college students who participate during the summer in the Freedom School program. These are young people that are part of the Children's Defense Fund to help educate, to help organize for the children in America. Over the past four decades, Mrs. Zelderman and the Children's Defense Fund's legislative impact on education has been tremendous. Well over 80 or 90 different pieces of legislation have been put together over these past four decades, which really focus on all of the needs of children and families. She has the capacity of inviting, persuading, and involving other people all the way from the local community to the halls of Congress. She has taken solid and strong position with members of Congress, both Democrats and Republicans. She's so determined to leave this little piece of real estate we call America a little better than we found it. If you have a conscience, you cannot help but be touched by the kind of commitment she has made and the kind of commitment she calls us to be engaged in, to see every child as our child. She takes you in and teaches you, but it's really the fire that she brings to everyone she meets that is infectious. She's been that persistent moral voice and keeps us on track in terms of recognizing that we can't give up. There's a cadre of people all over America in every corner of our country that follow her leadership, her vision. The legacy of Marion Wright Edelman, I think, will be on that short dash between two dates, birth date and date of transition, she made a difference. Congratulations, Marion, and thank you for your commitment. If there's anyone in America that should be honored the way she's been honored, it is her. Marion deserves the Lifetime Achievement Award because she's never quit. Best wishes and much love. Congratulations, Mrs. Edelman, for this award. Thank you for all you do for children. Congratulations, Marion. I am so proud of you. the luckiest person in the world because I've always had a cause worth fighting for. Um, but I also was born at the intersection of great events and great moral leaders, including my parents. And my first rebellion was when I was four years old and I went up to the Belks department store with one of my Sunday school and public school teachers and I was thirsty, so I went and 
drank out of the white water fountain, didn't know it was the white water fountain, wasn't reading really very well then. Um, but my teacher was terrified and she snatched me away. And I took my little psyche down and home crying and asked my parents what this was about. Um, they made it clear that it wasn't about me, it was about the society um, in which we live, but that we could, when you grow up, you can help change it. Well, I started right then because I began to sneak up to the department stores and others with black and white water fountains and I would switch the signs. <laughs> so that, um, and that was one way of getting back. But I was also very lucky um, in that I always had great role models, people who didn't have a whole lot of money, but who showed by the grace of their lives their loves of children and shared what little they had. And I had great parents who um, always made clear that if we saw something we didn't like or a problem that we could do something about it. Don't ask why somebody doesn't do something, do ask why you don't do something. Um, and I still think of my parents, and every time I attacked a new issue, but I was so lucky. Then I went off to Spelman College, and chapel was compulsory. And I rebelled, except that you would lose your quality points and grade point average, so I began to have to go. But the greatest speakers in America came through that chapel, from Dr. King to um, Dr. Benjamin E. Mays, his mentor. And Spellman gave me a whole new view of the ways in which I could make a difference. Um, and I'm so grateful for that. And I often ask today, who are our 10 moral leaders in America? Who, who is Father Ted Hesburgh um, in higher education? You know, who is our person, who, Phil Hart or Wayne Moore? So the moral voices in, in bipartisan ways in the Congress. But again, having been exposed to people who didn't say, why doesn't somebody do something, why don't I do something? And as a child, I was very moved by that. And so when people ask me why I do what I do, I do what I do because my parents did what they did, my community elders did what they did, and because they instilled a sense of justice and efficacy in me, in me um, from the very beginning. And I'm very grateful, and I'm very grateful for this award. And I'm very grateful to be here with Kaya. She's just a rock star. And it shows you that you believe in children and have high expectations for children that you can produce miracles. And I'm just very proud of her and delighted to be here with her. This is the most difficult time we've faced for children and for the safety net since I have been alive. We've had many, many changes before. Um, during the Reagan years, the budget came in and they were trying to dismantle the entire safety net. But we decided that we would fight, fight, and fight, and that the priority was to keep the laws in place because we lost the infrastructure of the laws that protected children and the poor that we would take decades, if ever, to get them back. And here we are now facing 50 years later, and we succeeded in many ways. We lost billions of dollars, but we laboriously got it all back, and we continued to try to move forward for our children. But now I think this is the time for us all to come together to sort of figure out what we are going to do to make sure our nation moves forward for all of our children. Something is really wrong in our nation. When we let our children be the poorest age group in America, we have 14.5 million children who are poor, and 6.5 million of those live in extreme poverty. The greatest threat to our national security does not come from any external enemy. The greatest threat to our military security does not come from any external enemy in many ways. It comes from our failure to invest in healthy, educated children who are going to be the leaders of the next generation. What is it about us that can tolerate a majority of all of our children, all racial and age group, not being able to read and at, at fourth and eighth grade levels, and a majority of our children, we know what's happening on dropout rates, but 70, over 70, majority of all of our children, all racial groups cannot read or compute, but over 70% of our Latino children and nearly 80% of our black children in fourth and eighth grade cannot read or compute at grade level. That's sentencing a child to economic and social death. We can do better than that. 
70% of our 17 to 24 year olds cannot get in the military because they cannot read adequately, they have undiagnosed or untreated health problems. Who's gonna be our military? Who's gonna be representing us in this ever increasing world? So we should be doing what is right for our children, but we better do it if it's in our self interest to do and do what is gonna prepare this country to lead, continue to lead the world and to be competitive in the world. And I just wanna make a very singular plea tonight is that we should end child poverty in America, that we should turn the threat to the safety net and resist it, but by resisting it, we should put forward the proposals that we know are gonna lead us forward and end the blight of child poverty in this country. It is a disgrace that 14 and a half million children are poor and six and a half million are extremely poor. And we cannot afford child poverty. We had Bob Solo, the Nobel laureate from MIT, do a cost of child poverty study for us. And he says that keeping 14 and a half million children in poverty cost our nation about a half trillion dollars every year, $500 billion in a year in foregone productivity and prison costs and dropouts. We can't afford to continue to do that. And we have this cradle to prison pipeline that we have got to break up. We are spending on average in our states three times more per prisoner than for public school pupil. That is about the dumbest investment policy you could have. It's time for us to end. And we know what to do. And we have made significant progress over the last almost 50 years that the Children's Defense Fund has been in existence. It is all at risk, but I'll just tell you, we are not going to go backwards. I don't know what we're gonna do, but we're gonna move forward. I'm not gonna let my grandchildren fight these same battles again. And each of us must stand up and make sure that we continue to move forward. It is unworthy of us as a nation to let our children be the poorest group of citizens and the younger they are, the poorer they are. We need a high quality early childhood system in place so that children are ready for school. We now have 95% of all children covered by CHIP and Medicaid. It's on the chopping block. We must not let those programs be dismantled. We must move forward, but we need the voices of powerful people like you and your children, there's no place to hide anymore. We're gonna to have to walk down the streets with those other people's children. And we all need to begin to give everybody a sense of hope, a sense that they are being cared for, and a sense of a future, and a sense of efficacy. And we can do that if we are going to have to do that if we are going to move forward as a nation. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great German Protestant theologian said that, he, well, he, I think we all know about him, he died opposing Hitler's Holocaust. But he said that the test of morality, and I would add the common sense of a society, is how it treats its children. But the United States is failing every second almost of every day when we let a child be neglected or abused every 47 seconds, be born into poverty every 37 seconds, to be born and without health insurance every 64 seconds, but what the pro we've seen the trajectory of positive process and that's beginning to change. And we have lost almost 180,000 children to gunfire in America since statistics began to get be kept in 1963. And a child is injured or killed by a gun every three hours. We can do better than that and none of us is safe from the violence of guns. And so I just hope that we will take this time that I consider a time of crisis and challenge as an opportunity to move ahead, to build the movement that is long overdue, to end child poverty. It's the most cost-effective thing we can do. Bob Solo's calculation said every year we keep 14 and a half million children in poverty, cost us $500,000 million week for about $67 million that we um, estimated from the Urban Institute studies, we could decrease child poverty overall by 60% right now for about, and we could decrease black child poverty by 72%. And I just hope that we will now launch a, on the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's death and the Poor People's Campaign, 
that we will launch a campaign to end child poverty in his honor, to put the program of prevention and early intervention in place so that our children can feel hope and it's gonna save us money. It's also gonna save our soul as a nation. And so I just come here tonight to say I hope you will join with us, um, that we have got to begin to change the priorities in our nation and our children have to come first. And so I hope that we can see your partnership as we move forward. We've got all the power we need to do that. And I just um, want to repeat what Albert Camus said a long time ago when he was speaking to a group of Catholics at the Dominican Monastery in 1948, and he said that perhaps we cannot prevent this world from being a world in which children are tortured, but we can reduce the number of tortured children. He described our responsibility as human beings if not to reduce evil, at least not to add to it, and to refuse to consent to conditions which torture innocence. I continue, he said, to struggle against this universe in which children suffer and die, and so must every one of us. Only then will the cries of the prophets for justice and peace become a lasting reality. And I would like to think that the richest, most powerful nation in the world, militarily and in many ways economically, can set a goal and achieve a goal that says we're going to see that every child gets a healthy start, every child gets a head start, quality head start, every child um, is safe from gun violence, every child is going to get ready for school, and every child is going to be able to graduate from school and be a contributing citizen. And we can achieve that if we decide to put our children first. So that I hope that you will join me in trying to talk about setting a goal for the richest nation on earth to end the poverty of our children. That is a goal worth living and dying for. Thank you.